several um, advisory committee on immunization practices um, does their voting and their recommendations to CDC and subsequently how our vaccine advisory committee then uh, votes on them. So, and then the governor's decision after that, of course. So this late April and May, those general um, groups will have more to come on that. The next part of this website that you can see is step two on where to get your COVID-19 vaccine. So this is the area that we had talked about previously about using that tool called PrepMod. And what we found is that the local health districts and working with all of their enrolled providers already had uh, products and, and tools that they were using to direct people locally on how they can sign up for a vaccine, how they can um, find out where the vaccines are located. And there's, they're using a variety of mechanisms to do that. But this chart on here is really to, to guide the user to find out where to go. And most of them have hotlines that they can call. We know, for example, age 65 and older, I need a variety of mechanisms. Um, I just listened to a, a show on NPR this morning about um, you know, seniors not necessarily being able to quickly navigate some of the um, provider portals to sign up for scheduling. And so it's really nice that we have this opportunity to have a phone number that people can call. So depending upon the area in which the, the person is located, um, you can either go online or you can call and get on a waiting list, get on a in the in the queue to have a call back to get your appointment scheduled, and sometimes we go directly to the to the location. So I'm not going to click on all these for fear of messing up <laughs> anything and ruining any technology, but I encourage you to go and look at the site, those sites. And then finally, the last thing that we have on this site is what to expect at your vaccination appointment. So this is just a, a user's guide to what to expect, um, things that you can do after you get vaccinated. And then, of course, over here on the side is to learn more information about each vaccine as it becomes available. Right now we have Pfizer and Moderna. Those are the two vaccines that we have available. And then we'll add more as more vaccines come. So that is my high level overview to give you an orientation on what we have available on our website. The other um, thing that I wanted to do with you today is walk you through again, I did this last time, uh, but not last week, but the week prior, is to talk about that whole distribution, that kind of vaccine allocation, ordering and distribution flow. I was verbally able to go through it with you, but we have a new tool that you can find on our site and this is under the coronavirus.idaho.gov site. If you go to the vaccine tab, you can find this as a link on there in PDF. So this is the graphic that um, walks you through the process. And I think it's a really great tool to help you think about um, how vaccines actually flow in the state. Uh, because there's a lot of um, you know, interesting and, and different perceptions of how vaccines are coming in. And we wanna make sure that people are very clear how it actually works. So I, I walked through this last time with you, but I'll, I'm gonna do it again, so bear with me. But this is a, a cadence that occurs every single week that's important to understand. And, it, and to also help you understand the state's role and the local health districts, we'll start, I'll start with the federal role, the state role, and then the local health district role and providers. So at the on at the beginning of the week, on Tuesdays, uh, at the federal level, the federal um, the Health and Human Services puts into a system called Tiberius the weekly allocation estimate that's provided to Idaho. You've all seen and heard that estimates are based on population, and uh, and in this case, in on adult populations. So it's preloaded for us at the federal level how much how much vaccine we expect to get for both first and second doses. And then on Wednesday, there's confirmation about what those numbers are. The, um, the IIP is the immunization um, program, the Idaho immunization program, shares those fi that final allocation information with the local health districts and afterwards ad adjust those doses as needed. So there's a conversation that occurs with the health districts and um, then those, those health districts then work with those locally enrolled providers 
to talk about how vaccine will be distributed out uh, within those providers. And <clears throat> then they finalize that per provider. So to narrow that down a little bit more, um, the health districts will, uh, we tell the health district how much they are going to be receiving based upon what Health and Human Services confirms with us. That amount that the health district gets is based upon the group that we're currently serving for vaccines. So for example, right now, we're working on um, frontline essential workers, that's uh, first responders, summarizing first responders, teachers, um, corrections um, and detention facility staff, and now seniors age 65 and older. So by health district, we look at the population estimates for those groups we're currently serving, and then tell them what their proportion of the doses are going to be for their health district. The health districts then uh, work with their, their community providers and um, just determine how much each provider will get based upon many factors, based upon their throughput, based upon their willingness to uh, participate with a particular group that's being vaccinated right now, um, decisions that they've previously made about potentially big events that are going on, and so they work that out locally, and then they tell us by provider how much each provider will be, will be receiving. And then the orders are placed by us as those plans are finalized. So um, as you can see, as you move over here to Sunday and Monday, all of that's being finalized. Um, and then we at the state level then order those doses. So we place the order within that system called Tiberius. And then through that system, those vaccines are pushed directly from the manufacturer to the providers that have been, been enrolled based upon the number of doses that they have said they will be taking. So that's what that vaccine delivered means. It does not mean that it comes to the Department of Health and Welfare. We are simply that broker, if you will, um, for the Health and Human Services, sending a notification to the, the manufacturer who then sends it directly to those enrolled providers. So as you can see, um, you know, we start <clears throat> getting all those doses in uh, the middle of the week, and then that process starts over um, every single week. We, we continue to go through that cyclical process. So um, I know there have been a lot of questions, and I hopefully I, I addressed several of those in that overview. Um, but that that was my my main tactic for today was to walk you through those two very practical steps. Uh, one to find on the website um, where where and when you can get your vaccine, and then two how that whole ordering process works. All of that is available through the coronavirus.idaho.gov site. And with that, I will turn it back to Zach, I believe. Hi, thanks, Alki. This is Nikki Forbingor. Zach is having some technical difficulties, so I'll take over the moderation from here on. Um, so we will now take vaccine-related questions from the media participants. We're gonna answer as many questions as possible in the time that we have available. Please raise your hand in WebEx by selecting the hand icon in the lower right portion of your screen. I see a few of you have already found the hand. Um, you can also type your question into the chat area, which you can access also in the lower right part of your screen. When I say your name, please unmute yourself and announce your name and media outlet before asking your question. So today we're gonna to start off with Melissa Davlin. Hi, this is Melissa Davlin with Idaho Public Television. Um, I was looking at the county by county information that you just released on the new vaccine tableau at coronavirus.idaho.gov. And I noticed there's a, a strong correlation between the counties with the highest vaccination rates and the lowest number uh, or percentage of residents living living in poverty. So it's not exactly a one-to-one -one correlation between wealth and access to the vaccine, but there's a pretty strong correlation there. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, you know, either Director Jepson um, or, or anyone else, if you wanted to weigh in on that access, because I wasn't finding any other major correlations as far as you know, med number of medical facilities or 
the age of the people who lived in the counties, the biggest indicator for that really was um, wealth and what I saw. Great. That's a, a great question. And uh, Melissa and I, you originally posed it to the director. So I'll ask him if he wants to make any comments. And of course, we have other other folks on here as well to address. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I always appreciate your excellent questions. They um, keep me on track. So thank you for that. Uh, you know, we, as Elke just described, the, the distribution of the doses is proportional to the population that is um, in those public health districts. And specifically, uh, it's been to based on number of healthcare workers, as that was the first phase, number of long-term care centers. As we move to the next phase, that was teachers and um, first responders, et cetera. Uh, and so that's the number of uh, doses that we see, and that's how they're allocated, has been based on those priority groups. Now, obviously, it's based on 65. So there's nothing in the allocation that would um, inherently be driven by income, from my perspective, because of those job classifications. So then the question becomes, are all of the uh, health districts then doing an equal job of getting those doses out to those populations? And there is some, um, we'll be publishing this data on Monday, so you can take a look directly. Uh, but it is not the same across the state and how doses have been administered, uh, how many number of doses have been administered. I'll, I'll stick with first doses. We do know, and I, as I mentioned in my opening comments, of our existing inventory, about 22,000, at least on Sunday, of those for first doses. And just to put a percentage behind that, that means Idaho has administered 82% of our first doses that we've received. Uh, and so given that allocation, given most of them have been delivered in the first doses, we're, we, we don't, it's, we're not sensing or seeing an, an economic bias in, in what's been done. Uh, I think the real place, and that's a place that I frankly worry about, is now, as we move into the 65 and older uh, group, uh, is really making sure we achieve that equity across uh, not only race and ethnicity, but also income across rural and urban. That's real, this is really our first um, general public view and I think that's the place we're going to have to be extra diligent to make sure that we're not disadvantaging any group because of a characteristic that they have so but I would say today we actually I feel pretty good that we've we've been pretty equal and fair uh, I think going forward it's going to it's going to be really important we continue to monitor that okay um, we're going to move on to our next uh, person who has their hand up and that's Audrey Dutton Hello, this is Audrey Dutton from the Idaho Statesman. Uh, I am curious what happened um, on Friday or over the weekend or late last week with the doses that were expected, the, the hospitals were expecting um, to get more than they did, both St. Luke's and St. Al's and across health districts. So I'm wondering, you know, after um, walking us through the, the process and the cadence and things like that, it sounded like you know, it would be at the health district level where that communication would break down, but it was across multiple different health districts. So I'm trying to figure out what happened. Um, can you speak to that at all? Do you know what happened? Thanks, Audrey. And um, I I know that probably the director and, and Sarah had a little bit more visibility into this, but you are you are correct. Those allocations do occur at the local public health district. Um, they have those conversations locally. Um, from my limited understanding, I know that there was kind of a mix between um, uh, there perhaps was you know maybe some communication issues. I'm not entirely sure, um, but also we know that um, there was an issue with some of the scheduling end of it through one of the, the larger hospitals, but I am going to ask if either the director or Sarah have more that they want to add to that. Um, it, yeah, okay, I'll uh, follow up to that as well. Thank you, Audrey, for the question. Uh, obviously, our goal, the public health district goal and, um, uh, and the provider's goal for sure is to make sure that every dose gets out but that we also do, we also uh, don't schedule people and have to cancel. And that's just unfortunate when that happens. We saw some of that happen over the weekend. Uh, I do not know the exact nature of where that breakdown occurred between the public health districts and the providers. And so I'll leave that to them to speak to. Uh, but it was the impetus for us to uh, go ahead. We had been made aware earlier in the week that CVS was not planning to use all of their uh, doses that they had been given for long-term care centers. Uh, based on based on their information they had, 
Uh, and so we used that uh, situation as an impetus to go ahead and reallocate uh, some of those CVS doses. And I mentioned that in my opening comments, but to repeat, we took 12,000, approximately 12,600 total doses. So that's um, 6,300 first doses and allocated those around the state. But we did send uh, several of those, uh, several of those trays that come in trays, um, sorry to use that term, specifically to providers here in the Treasure Valley uh, so that they would uh, be able to uh, keep as many appointments as possible. Uh, so we were fortunate that we just out of chance had that opportunity to use the CVS doses that gave us a really good reason to move quickly on that uh, and to get those doses to those providers so they could keep as many of those appointments as possible. Um, I do think that going forward, um, uh, there will, there's, I think there was lots of communication about uh, better communication about the allocation that happens each week between the provider and the and the uh, health district. So, um, and anyway, so that's just a little bit more insight into what happened over the weekend. Okay, so I should check in with the health districts and the providers then. Yeah, I knew that, that that was where those conversations and decisions occurred, and I would be a little reticent to speak on their behalf. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, it looks like we have a question from Trevor Fay. There we go. Can you folks hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hey, this is Trevor with uh, CBS Two News, and something that I was wondering um, during the course of our conversation here is in regards to the pharmacies, is there anything that individual pharmacies can do to lobby for additional doses of the vaccine, or is it all entirely based off of population for a given area? Yeah, thanks, Trevor. I can uh, um, we'll use our team effort like we always do for these. Uh, absolutely, the, the pharmacies should contact their local health districts and the areas that they serve uh, to talk about that local distribution plan. Um, we, we participated in several calls over the last few weeks with providers in the health districts and typically they have groups that they bring together and they have those conversations. Um, certainly if they don't uh, provide those vaccines on a kind of a one-on-one -on -one basis, they can, we've seen efforts with the, the local public health districts and vaccine and sorry, excuse me, and pharmacy providers coming together to do high throughput events. Um, kind of traveling uh, strike teams, if you will. There's a lot of a lot of different uh, kind of innovations for how they're getting vaccine out. So I would encourage every local pharmacy to contact their local health district. First step, however, of course, is that they have to become a COVID-19 uh, enrolled provider if they aren't already. And I'm sorry if I missed it, but what are the qualifications for that to become the provider? I will let uh, Sarah Leeds take that. There are many. Um, they they have to uh, have a medical director. They have to have certain storage equipment. Um, I mean, there are, there are several pages worth of of requirements that providers uh, have to adhere to to become a COVID vaccine provider. What would you say is the most relevant for for this situation, or the most common? Relevant to vaccinating? Uh, correct. Yeah, like the one that you would recommend these folks tackle first if there's a long list that they have to meet. Um, gosh, that's a hard one. I think ensuring appropriate storage and handling equipment is one of the more critical pieces because if you can't ensure the vaccine is stored appropriately, then then it may or may not be a, an, a, effective. So I think that may be one of the more critical pieces, but but they are all really important. Um, you know, we providers need to know how to administer the vaccine appropriately, how to report any adverse events. So, you know, every piece of it, I would say, is re is really important. But maybe the first step is 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 ensuring that they have the appropriate uh, equipment, um, because without that, they can't keep moving through the enrollment process. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. And Sarah, if I may add, uh, Trevor, if you go to the coronavirus.idaho.gov site under the vaccine tab, you'll see a big blue button that says resources for COVID-19 providers. And if you wanna see what some of those requirements are, you can find out the list on that site. Perfect, I'll be sure to check that out. Thank you. 
Okay, um, I want to take a minute to just let everyone know that um, I'm pleased to be able to say that interpreter Stubbs has been able to join us. If you would like to pin his video to your screen, if you scroll through the uh, panelist uh, videos, you'll see a little circle there with three dots in it. You can click on that and you can click pin, uh, pin this video to this spot. So I wanted to make that uh, announcement. Um, so we'll move on to our next question. This will come from uh, Rachel Cohen. Hello, this is Rachel with Boise State Public Radio. Um, so yesterday on a press call, St. Luke's officials recommended people check my chart multiple times a day because appointments could appear sporadically. I think that that was further clarified that most of them would be on open on Mondays. Um, but clearly this is not something that everyone even in the 65 plus category can can do you know check the website multiple times a day call around to all providers who might have vaccines available um but this seems to be the system that that the largest health district in the state is relying on so i'm wondering what the state is doing to ensure equity in this case that it's not just people who have time and connections to call around to see where vaccines are available that um, just want to hear more about the equity. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. It is incredibly challenging and definitely an imperfect system. And it's not just Idaho, it's every single state. I, I, like I've mentioned before, I'm on multiple calls a week with my peers across the country and everyone is facing the same situation and trying to make sure that we're doing the best we can to provide um, opportunities for people to get their vaccine, everyone who wants it. So, um, you know, I know that many of the health districts or all of the health districts are trying to find those opportunities for people to have a, a variety of mechanisms to connect with a vaccine provider, whether that's, like I mentioned, through a, a phone call, but we know that there are long, uh, you know, um, phone trees that are going on or long wait times. Um, there are definitely the, the website situation and trying to, to um, make sure that you can keep checking back and finding those available appointments. Those, we, I think as we get more vaccine into the state, it's definitely going to help that because there's going to be more appointments available that'll make it much easier. But we are working with our health districts and through our communications office to make sure that we have chances for people to reach out um, and try to meet, meet populations where they are whether they uh, have you know, their local pharmacy reaching them or they have their local public health district sending flyers or um, you know, holding events locally to help people navigate that. I think we're gonna have to see you know, more and more novel solutions to that as we move forward because the population, it's, it's a large number of people obviously and we need to implore a, a lot of uh, different ways of connecting people to those appointments. But, we continue to work with our health districts on an almost daily basis, trying to help resolve any issues that we can and however we can do our best to communicate, we, we certainly will. And Director or Sarah, please, if there's anything you want to add, please do so. Yeah, okay, I'm happy to. This is Sarah. <clears throat> um, we, are, we have outreach and education um, staff and then a communication support system behind them that are working to uh, have those mechanisms in place for folks who maybe don't have technology access and time to call every day. Um, the way we'll be, we'll be able to implement those, those methods when we have more vaccine, just like you said. So, so those, those plans are in place or they're, they're in, you know, we're working on those and we just can't implement them right now because of the limited vaccine. Okay, um, our next question comes from Kyle Fonnensteel. Hi, uh, I'm Kyle from the Post Register in Idaho Falls. Uh, I, I guess just a quick follow-up on, on what you said, Sarah. Um, what is that, what are those systems gonna look like? Is that gonna go through the state or local health districts for, for ways people can equitably connect with vaccine providers? Well, I think it'll be different in different regions of the state, and it'll be different as we um, look to work and increase vaccine access in different populations. And so 
Um, we're looking to um, be more culturally aware and and you and listen to um, listen to the groups who who represent those populations and 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 work with work and work to distribute the vaccine in the ways that they that make sense. Uh, and so you know whether those might be in vaccinations in churches or or opening up um, you know a mobile clinic, taking it to um, agricultural workers and things like that. So those are the things that we're doing. Um, I also wanted to ask about the, the governor's executive order last week um, required that vaccine providers report their inventory daily. I'm, I'm wondering to what extent were providers reporting either to the state or local public health districts their inventory and how was their inventory used to change any allocation formulas? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll start that and I will probably call on Sarah to to follow up with that. We do know that, you know, with each local public health district, they, like I said, they have those relationships already established with those enrolled providers. And um, so a lot of times they're having almost daily conversations with them about what they have going on uh, locally, what their inventories look like. Um, we can see certainly in our immunization, um, in our ordering system, what inventory they have on hand. So um, with the with the reporting, I think there's there's still some some um, areas that we need enhanced so we have better visibility into to exactly what's going on with those because we know, for example, some of them might have what looks like a, a high number of inventory, but they might have a, a, a what am I trying to say? A high throughput event, or some sort of mass mass event that's being planned a few days later. So, some of those nuances are a little bit um, challenging to see just at the highest level. But those local health districts typically have a, a, a decent handle on what those um, providers have on hand. But definitely more visibility, more clarity is needed. Hence the executive order. But Sarah, I'm going to let you maybe tag on to that, or director, if you have more you want to add. Yeah, I think I think you've summarized it really well, Elke. I don't have anything else to add. Um, and then I think the only thing I would add is uh, one of the reasons we want to make that um, information public is uh, several reasons. One is so you at, uh, and all of the public can see who has doses and where the inventory is. Uh, I, I think that that also um, encourages um, if, if there are uh, situations and, and that uh, a provider has started to build up inventory. We want that to be both public as well as visible to the public health district so that uh, a conversation can be had to say what's the what's the situation there. And as Elke mentioned, it could be they have a bunch of appointments for a high throughput clinic in three days and they have inventory for that. Or it could be that they're having trouble getting their doses out because they have staff that are out sick or whatever the case might be. Uh, so that can then lead to a conversation that says, well, what do we need to do about that? Do we need to transfer some of those doses to somebody else who has a need? Do we need to leave it where it is? Because that's going to re rectify it. And those conversations would happen at a public health district level. Uh, so there's not a hard and fast rule um, that, that, that says, hey, if you have one dose that's longer than seven days, here's what happens. What it really is at this point is a tool so that we can all see what's happening and we can have the right conversations to make sure that we accomplish the goal that the governor set out, which is that for all these first doses that come in, uh, that that happens within seven days of receipt. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of this call, that they're actually just starting to get our first look at this level of data this week, uh, we realized we had 22,000 in inventory on Sunday. That's actually less than we're administering as a state each week as first doses. And so uh, at this point, we're feeling much, much better that doses are getting out into arms and it's within seven days for first doses. Okay, um, we'll move on to uh, Kim Fields. Kim, I'm going to unmute you. I'm on my phone. Can you guys hear me? There, now we can hear can you. Hear you. Me okay. Yep. Oh, perfect. Hi, director. It's Kim Fields from KTBB. Kind of going off what you were just mentioning. Um, first, I want to clarify: is it twenty-two thousand or twelve thousand um, that were reallocated from CBS? 
Uh, Kim, this is uh, Director Jepson here. Yes, uh, we, what was reallocated from CVS was about 12,600 doses. Uh, that includes both first and second. So if you break it down to number of first doses that, we, that were reallocated from CVS was about 6,300. Okay, um, so then kind of following up on that, you mentioned 101,000 doses are unused in Idaho. So where are the other 88,000 doses that haven't been administered yet? And why yeah. is it taking so long to figure that out? Again, great question, and I actually I ran through that a little bit in my opening comments, but let me just uh, go through that here for a, in a little bit more detail. Um, we had about, as on Sunday, we had about 101,000 doses that had been received by Idaho that had not been administered. And so let me just run through, uh, now that we actually have some better visibility, where those doses are. Uh, of those 101, there were about 22,000 that were first doses. Um, so of the 101, there was about 22,000 first doses. And again, I'll just comment, that's, uh, that's actually less than a week's worth of inventory, uh, or meaning we're actually administering more than 22,000 first doses a week. So basically, we expect, right now we're seeing that doses are getting out, first doses are getting out within about seven days. Um, next is second doses. So of that 101,000 doses that had not been administered, we have 47,500 second doses in the state. Um, and that's higher than we were expecting. Uh, so we actually have some work to do to understand what's happening with second doses. Uh, second doses are shipped a week early, so we do know that they sit for a week uh, and then before they can be used, and then the appointment has to get scheduled. Uh, but that's still higher than we were expecting, so that's uh, that's the second group. So again, 22,000 first doses, 47,500. These are approximate second doses. Um, and then finally is the Federal Pharmacy Partnership. That's with CVS and Walgreens that was that is administering doses to long-term care centers, uh, and they had 32,000 doses uh, that had not been administered yet uh, as of Sunday evening. So that's the third chunk of doses. Um, of that 32,000, we reallocated 12,600, and I should say that 32,000 with uh, CVS and Walgreens is both first and second doses. Uh, so of that 32,000, we reallocated. 12,600, or again, 6,300 first doses uh, that was sent out, uh, reallocated over the weekend and will arrive on Wednesday. Um, and then we will continue to work with Walgreens this week and plan to make a reallocation from Walgreens back to other providers uh, for next week. And we have not arrived at a number for that. But just to summarize, 22,000 first doses, 47,500 second doses, and 32,000 with the federal pharmacy program is where those doses are. Any idea why they were sitting on them? Um, I don't know if sitting on them is a is an accurate characterization. I think they were working through the facilities. Uh, it's my understanding that CVS is finished up or will have finished up in the next day or two. All of the facilities they had, Walgreens is still working through theirs. Um, and I, I would guess that uh, they've either had a lower uptake than they expected, or there was an overestimation of the actual number of residents and staff at those long-term care centers. So we're not sure exactly why they had uh, so many extra doses, uh, but we once we realized that that was the case, we were uh, they were very very forthcoming and very willing to reallocate them back to the state. Great, right, thank you. Okay, um, our next question is going to come from Hyatt Noramine. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but there hi. We go. Um, thank you. And can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I just wanted to get a better picture of the immunocompromised category. So um, I, you mentioned that there were 265,000, 65 and older. I'm wondering if you have an estimate for how many um, cat are categorized in the high risk with uh, medical conditions. Um, and, and a second part of my question is, um, my understanding is that the CDC recommended having um, first 75 and older and then the, in the second group, have it be 65 and older plus those with high risk medical conditions. So I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little on the decision not to include um, them in, in, in this. Yes, thanks, Hyatt. Um, I can touch, I, I have Dr. Hahn also on the call who has been helping to support our um, COVID-19 vaccine advisory committee. Um, but I will start at the, the highest level and say that 
with, um, I'm going to jump to the age grouping first because I don't have the numbers for uh, people in that high risk category off the top of my head, that population estimate, although we, we do have it available, I just don't have it off the top of my head. But uh, yes, you're correct. CDC did recommend, um, well, through ACIP uh, to CDC, recommended age 75 and older um, being in that group. When we brought that forward, because as I mentioned, um, I think I mentioned on this, this call, that our vaccine advisory committee has uh, most notably been following the CDC slash ACIP guidance as it comes forward. So when that when when that decision was made by CDC, we brought that to our our vaccine advisory committee, and had them weigh in on uh, if we should open up to age 65 and older per the CDC um, the guidance. With that, we had several members of our vaccine advisory committee uh, and and the public send in comments and questions about. Um, extending that group to age 65 and older. Uh, we looked at all of our data related to kind of what age groups are actually contributing to hospitalizations, uh, what are the population numbers, kind of looking at that whole epidemiology piece. And through that process and through those discussions, the, the Vaccine Advisory Committee recommended to the governor to um, lower that age limit down to age 65. So that was what was recommended to the governor, and he accepted that recommendation. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hahn to see if she has anything that she would like to add to that. Um, she also sits on ACIP calls. Yeah, thank you, Elke. Can you hear me okay? We can. <laughs> um, yeah, so as you said, we, we, you know, in sitting on the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices with CDC, I can tell you that at the federal level, as well as at our state level, these, none of this is easy. Um, there are uh, passionate arguments made for age-based vaccination. There are passionate arguments made for essential workers. Um, you know, again, talk about health, health equity, people who have less access to health care. And um, there's merit in every, you know, every position. So as Elke mentioned at our advisory committee meeting, we actually offered, I think we gave them four options plus plus kind of a, I believe it was like an opt out, none of these look good to me type of thing. And, and what the first one was, hey, are we going to follow the CDC current ASIP recommendation for 75 and above? But we also had heard so many people um, interested in the 65 and above that we offered that as an another option for them to vote on. It's all public, you certainly can go, um, I think of the recordings, Nikki, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the recordings of those meetings are available. If not, we certainly have notes from the meetings and all the presentation slides that were presented. And of course the meetings themselves, any of you all can listen into. So there was discussion and as Elke said, they voted to uh, lower the age to 65 and um, the governor accepted that recommendation. And the, the second part of your question uh, was regarding the number of people in the high risk category that age 16 to 64. And oh, um, as we I have that, LP. you do. OK, I'm okay. sorry. I should have okay. brought that up. I'm sorry. I, I had that pulled up because I thought we might get asked questions. And like you, I can't keep all those numbers in my head. <laughs> so as um, the question was for 1864 with high risk conditions, the estimate is 371,000. 127. That is the population estimate that um, we will be working with as we uh, look at that group. Thank you. And um, my question was more uh, targeted towards why why the immunocompromised ended up not being included. Was that one of the options to vote on, um, or it, it was more about that than the 60 at okay. broadening it to 65 and older? Hyatt, I can I can Elke, I can try to take a stab at that. Um, so CDC has a published list on their website, and uh, if anybody, I can grab it after I'm done talking and throw it into the chat, but they list uh, conditions that have been shown to be, to increase the risk for COVID and severe COVID disease. And we are following that list at present um, for what we're considering high risk conditions. So um, I, I will tr I'll try to throw that list into the chat, but um, that is what so far we've been using. And and uh, 
anything was on the table, we provide options for, for advisory committee to kind of help start the conversation. Uh, but the committee itself can propose other um, groups and other individuals as well. So it's it's we don't limit their choices. Okay, we will move on to our next question, which comes from uh, Shira Matuzawa. Hi, Shira from KTVB here. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. So um, we've received reports that certain organizations have jumped the line in front of others when it comes to getting the vaccine. How is this possible? And are you guys investigating anything like this? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, certainly, we know that um, it's challenging on the provider end to um, manage all of the, the different population groups that are coming through the queue. Um, we, there's, we're not policing that. We're asking, we're strongly encouraging providers are doing the same to make sure that they are vaccinating the people in the priority group at the time at which they're designated. Um, so while we do, I, I know that the local public health districts, for example, when they hear about it with a provider, they talk to them about it. Uh, we have even seen situations where at times the providers are maybe out of appointments and they're wanting to dip into a different priority group that we're not currently vaccinating. So the health district has worked with them to reallocate those doses elsewhere. Um, so they're, they're trying to stay on top of it as much as possible, but um, as you can imagine, when we're doing, you know, thousands and thousands of doses a week and we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that are lined up and in queues, it's, it's nearly impossible to manage every, every single um, person that's going through. But I, I would say overall, given um, what we're doing in Idaho and the nation, we're doing pretty darn good. <laughs> I think people are being very respectful of the priority groups that we're in. Um, and, you know, I, I hear great stories about people's excitement and they, you know, they're anxious to get in, but they don't want to cut the line. They want to do what's right. And I, I would say that that's the pervasive sentiment that we're hearing about. Um, but, you know, we just want to make sure that we also get those messages out there as well. You know, please stick with your priority groups and also be patient and knowing that some of those priority groups are going to take a while to get through. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we'll move on to a question from Katie Clark. And given the fact that it's now 327, this will be our last question today. This is Katie Clark from the Idaho Business Review. Last week, the governor said that Idaho has been receiving fewer vaccines on a per capita basis than other states, and that the state of Idaho would be seeking clarification from the federal government as to why this was so. Has there been any clarification or response received back about this matter? Thank you, Katie. And I'm going to turn that over to the director to see if he's had any recent conversations and we can um, round that out with some further information. Uh, thank you, Katie. Excellent question. Um, we have had uh, conversations with our federal partners. And the first piece of information we learned was that the allocation is actually based on adults, 18 and older in each state, not total population. Um, and it depends on which data source you look at, but the Idaho has the second or third highest proportion of children or those under 18 of any state in the country. Uh, and so that actually reduces our, um, that reduces our allocation a bit because we then look smaller than we would normally. Um, and then secondarily, is it appears that they're using data that is from um, the, not the most recent uh, census data. Uh, and being a rapidly growing state, uh, that means that number is probably even smaller than it should be. Uh, so we have continued to raise with our federal partners that we think we are uh, not where we need to be in terms of our allocation compared to other states. Um, uh, I don't. I think it's unlikely they're going to reduce allocation in other states, but what we're asking is as we go forward that we get that recalibrated so Idaho does get its fair share of uh, vaccinations. Uh, so I can assure you that's an active conversation that um, it takes, place, it takes place regularly and something that's really important to us that we fight for Idaho to get at least its fair share of doses. Nikki, you're, you're muted, I believe, there, Nikki. 
Thank you, Director. Sorry about that. Um, so that does bring us to the end of the hour we had planned for this. Um, we are planning another media briefing about COVID-19 vaccine in Idaho at 2.30 p.m. Mountain Time next Tuesday, February 9th. Um, you can watch for those details on Monday. And thank you for joining us today.